Hi. Hello. Hi. What, what? Oh my god! I just completely forgot what I was going to say. Wait, what was the question again, Elia? We're all doing really get great. <laughs> We're on top form, everyone. <laughs> Hello, it's me, Ilya. Hello, my name is Tyber. Hello, my name is Saha. Hello, my name is Ange. Hello, my name's Anne. Hi, my name is Miriam. Hello, my name is Rafaro, but my friends call me Ram. Hi everyone, my name is Veronica. Hello, my name's Selika. Hello, my name's Miriam. Welcome to SLT Time. So today we're doing a bit of a special episode we've got the whole gang here um from the slt time behind the scenes crew you've seen us all at in different various episodes but it's actually been a while since we've all been together in one space so it's going to be a really nice episode for us and hopefully for you guys as well so 2020 is coming to an end and a lot has happened this year and we thought it would be really nice to kind of reflect on what we've done through SLT time, but also what's changed through speech therapy as a profession and all the work that we've all been doing online and um, in our individual workplaces as well. So I thought it would be good to first talk about sort of the story so far um, for people who may not know who we are um, and where we, where we started from. Most of the members of SLT Time, but not all, were part of the Diversity Working Group. So the Royal College held an event last year. Um, and from there, sort of a natural group formed. Uh, we all stayed in contact through social media, kept in touch, and um, sort of created this network which stemmed from that Royal College event. Um, but what really created the SLT project was all of the shocking events of 2020, the death of George Floyd and similar incidents that were happening over the year that really forced everyone across the country to take action and do something about the current state that we live in. So online outrage just kept growing, as particularly within our profession. Um, and I think Anne here made it really evident the lack of diversity that was all over the Royal College social media pages. Um, on their website, on their Instagram, and also so many people started bringing up the fact that the Royal College were the only people to not bring out a Black Lives Matter statement uh, in the immediate months since George Floyd's death. And this was all obviously really upsetting and frustrating. Um, and I think just a large number of people started to speak out and discuss their frustrations with the lack of representation, empathy, consideration, cultural competency, um, generally within speech therapy as a profession. So again, um, SLT time kind of formed naturally um, and organically from a group of like-minded, passionate, driven speech therapists who found comfort in communicating with others from shared experiences. Uh, the idea for the podcast series grew from that um, and from the desire to sort of emulate the space that we had created amongst ourselves on a larger scale and give other speech therapists, um, particularly speech therapists of colour, a voice and highlight lived experiences of our communities um, who are struggling as students and as working professionals within our, um, the speech therapy world. And 
I think our, I, I think we'd all agree that our original vision and our original aim was about creating this space, creating this platform that was uh, particularly for speech and language therapists from black and ethnic minority backgrounds um, to discuss um, openly, uh, frankly, without judgment and freely um, about their experiences in the profession in the hope that we can just make these issues known um, and hopefully instigate change from the powers who are able to make it happen. So I thought it'd be nice for us to discuss amongst ourselves. Um, do you, do we feel um, that we've achieved this goal um, or is it something that we still are working towards as a collective? Um, so I think that um, we have really, it feels weird to like pat ourselves on the back, but I think we need to, because I think we've really opened up a new, space to have these conversations and it's making others have these conversations i think in terms of completely eradicating any kind of racism or injustice or inequality in speech and language therapy i that's going to take ages but as with any institution so we probably won't be able to see that but i think what i think is really important i think it's great that we've done this within speech and language therapy um even if it is a small profession and the big scale of things is that we've kind of created a space for people to have these conversations um at work i've had people come up to me and be like oh um i, I like heard you on slt time and what you said about this this and this was great i think i have only been on like one or two episodes so i don't want to toot my own horn but i am a celebrity pretty much and like <laughs> but i think it's so nice that like i when i have um white colleagues and say things like that it's like oh my god this is actually nice so like you are taking the time to actually stop and think and it is uncomfortable and i know it can be quite hard listening for um people that haven't gone through the same experiences to hear but i think it's so important that we've kind of opened up that space so i think we're doing amazing and i'm excited to see where it goes as well mm. Mm. I agree. I've definitely had feeling like a minor celebrity moments recently with emails and conversations with others. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. And I think, um, you know, I was, I was actually thinking back in preparation for this episode and we have achieved, I think, quite a lot. I was thinking about some of the topics that we covered and they've been really varied um, and I think we did open up that discussion as well, like even on social media and like Anne said at work, I think people are thinking about diversity a lot more within speech and language therapy and how they can amend things, um, you know, little things that they can do to make it a better experience for families from diverse communities. Um, so that's, yes, I think definitely we should be really proud of that. Um, and at the same time, there's so much more to do. Like I was thinking about so many other topics that we can cover and it's just such a big subject, I guess, that um, definitely makes me excited for what's to come as well. And mm, nervous about all the work that we've got left to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just never ending, isn't it? isn't it? I don't think we could ever sort of reach that point where we're like, yes, we can achieve that. Yeah. Way sort of close yeah. that chance um but just looking back and i think it's one of one of the best things that came out of lockdown really um in terms of the change um even in discussions and in conversations mm. i want to add to that sorry um <laughs> uh, please tell me if i'm talking too much no i will just <laughs> talk non-stop um, but I really like the fact that it's kind of brought us as a group together as well. And that, like, I think there definitely feels like there's a lot more of a community of speech and language therapists of colour. Like, on my course, I know it was, like, me and three or four other girls. And I kind of thought that was it because when I was on yeah. placement, I didn't really uh, come across that many. But, like, I really like knowing that, like, I have you guys and, like, sharing the little stories that you wouldn't necessarily, like, it wouldn't be a massive complaint, like, um, I know like Veronica and everyone has like shared stories of things that have happened to them and it's not really a massive complaint but it is just like ah this has happened and like having that space of people that will understand I think it's really nice and I've had like I had a girl reach out to me on, on LinkedIn and was like oh like me and this other girl have like become really good friends by like listening to your podcast and it's nice and we've like reached out to other people on um, 
Twitter as well. And I was like, this is like so nice that you have like, like growing little support bubbles as well. So I'm really grateful for you guys as well, because it's been like a really, especially like starting a new job for me in the pandemic has been weird. And like, just knowing that like in the pandemic, I'm like with everything going on, it's just been absolutely weird. So it's just nice having people that are in, some are in similar situations, some have already been there. It's just really nice to have us as a group as well. Oh, definitely. I love the community and the network that we've built through this as well, definitely. I think I would just want to add in the point of like everyone else's point and saying how we're such a source of information for people where some of the things that we're just discussing so just like our narratives is so informative for other people because for us it's like some of our day-to-day -day lives for them they have no idea what, like the slightest thing so for us talking about like racial bias these people some of them have never heard of it so it's like source such a source that they can't really get through the education system at university or there's nowhere online that has this open discussion so I think the abundance of information that we're sharing and I think that is just something that's really key that you can't find unique. Definitely. Yeah. And I also think um, it's not just learning from each other, I've, I've learned so much from everyone here. Um, but also learning from all the guests because I think everyone comes with such an interesting perspective and experience as well as like clinically I feel like we've gone into quite we've discussed quite a few clinical areas and um I definitely feel like it's a bit of CPD definitely. yeah definitely, definitely taking notes <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to listen to an episode that I'm not in like three times so I can process it <laughs> I think like when when this all started I was a student like in the, my last couple of months of of being a third year student and now I'm like newly qualified and trying to get used to the working life but I think just having this as a as a project and just seeing it grow um has been really nice because when I think back to like 2016 slash 2017 when I was applying for SLT I like YouTubed speech and language therapy and I think one account came up mm -hmm. and now when you google speech and language therapy I know that our account pops up SLT time for like prospective students or students who are currently at uni and it's really great to know that what wasn't out there now exists so I think that in itself is an achievement that that we're here for like opening up conversations to students but also now we're being almost signposted to to by like other students it's quite nice yeah i just want to say like also it's been really nice watching all the students who are part of this so or quite a few of you were students sort of like grow into your nqp and get your jobs and everything which is just really nice isn't it and like this is what's happened over the past few months. Me and Ange are now working for the same trust and like just really cute like um network yeah. that we've made. It feels like a little little family watching you guys um, get your jobs and everything. It's really nice. I think also um because we've raised awareness about these cultural issues, um it's made people realise that they need to do more training on it because you know like me and you, Ilya, we did that talk for Reading University and I know you've done a talk for another university as well and a couple of other people have done other talks. Uh, so it's like we're getting asked to talk and provide training and give more information about this kind of thing. So I think it's really getting through to people that this is something that's really important. Definitely. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. And I want everyone to think about their best moment of SLT time so far. I know there's quite a few, <laughs> like some mind so hard. I know there were some mind blowing comments that were made, and I was like, "Oh my god, yeah!" But if you could think of one moment which was like that was your memorable SLT moment, what would you say? Oh, actually, I can think of mine. I bet you guys are going to think that this was yours as well when I say it. But you know when um, Warda dropped the comment about the bamboo growing. <laughs> It was so simple, but for some reason, I will never forget that. And I think I've actually said it to a couple of my students already. Um, so whoever hasn't watched that episode yet, go watch it. Um, SRT and the Youth Justice System. But for a summary, Wada said that she tells her students that a bamboo tree grows five years underground before you see any of it spurt or grow above. 
Um, and so that's really, really nice metaphor when you're helping young people. Oh, I loved that episode. I think that's my highlight from the, and I learned so much through that episode from all of you that were on there. So that's my favorite. Mm. I think my being, you know, the Maggie, um, when you guys did the Maggie, what was it called? The SLB, SLT to B webinar and how that was like, thing. Oh, and it was okay. just so great to see some students like really interested and how you guys like led it and how it was so great. So I think that was mine just seeing that like come into light and everyone was so in it and on it and it was quite nice. Yeah, that was fun. So that was the Magpie Magpie Seminars by Amy, Amy Stevens. Yeah, that was really fun. And I think she wasn't expecting there to be such an overwhelming SLT time presence. Like she tried to get a diverse panel and it ended up being like five of us and then one other person or something. I think my favourite moment, this is really cheesy again, but the first episode, because I think it was just nice to like start off. It was about... Um, it was about like the RCSLT and the Black Lives Matter statement and how that came about. And I think that kind of, that was a really nice way to get the ball rolling. And for me, it kind of, because I remember like when I did tweet and was like, there's no statement. And I felt like an angry black woman. And it was nice to actually just talk it to and it's like, okay, I am right. And there are other people that do agree with me and there is a community here. And so I think that episode for me personally was my um, highlight. I think for me, um, the last episode, the latest episode with Dr. Reem was just super interesting yeah. and it really made me think a lot about how, um, you know, there's systemic racism within, you know, what we're taught and the way that we're made to think. Um, and, you know, we then look at children and try and put them against all of these, you know, British or Western um kind of milestones and standards but we can't we shouldn't really be doing that so I think it's kind of really made me think a lot and um, I'm going to be seeing how I can adapt my practice to um, take that kind of thing into account. Mm -hmm. Yeah that was a top three episode for me. I think um, for me I think Dr. Reem's episode was definitely up there Mm. because I think I was a little bit obsessed with her <laughs> I was just like oh my god this is where I want to be in like however many years time um but I think another really good episode was the cultural competency one that we did mm. um because that just sort of opened my eyes and made me link things that I've experienced myself and what I do as a speech and language therapist I think sometimes we it, it is that we, we are still part of the speech and language therapy system so even for us the way that we think is actually what we've been how we've been taught to think or how we see things we see things from a specific lens even like even for me so I sort of have to unlearn that and I don't always link my own experiences so for example when we talked about um language and being told that you know it's okay to speak your own language in the speech and language session like in the clinic or in the school and I actually started doing that with some of the students that I work with and it's just amazing and I just never link that together and I just think how did I not do that when I had the same experiences as a child but I think it's just thinking thinking um of how I'm seeing things myself and how I can change my own practice as well I think that really opened up my eyes in that sense yeah I really liked um that episode yeah. as well I thought it was really inspiring listening to um Sean Pert how he was talking about um having interpreters with him doing when he was doing therapy sessions because I think normally a lot of people just think about having an interpreter to do an assessment but people don't tend to then use an interpreter for therapy as well mm -hmm. and I just thought that was really inspiring and it kind of made me feel a bit more empowered to ask for that as well in my own practice um, so yeah I definitely feel like I could now say you know I want to have an interpreter with me to do some sessions with the child and the parent as well rather than just having you know like the interpreter for a one-off assessment. Yeah definitely I agree also shout out congratulations Sean Pert on your new role in the Royal College whoop, whoop. Um, yeah. also, I thought um, yeah it was really interesting having Elizabeth there from a social linguist perspective like I agree that episode I thought definitely top three for me as well I'm gonna say that about every episode but 
yeah, I thought it was really interesting. I love having all the different perspectives. I think one of the best things that we've done is bring people who are not speech therapists into the conversation because it's just so interesting, like hearing how interconnected everything is and how we really need to be thinking outside of the box of what we're taught at university. I think um, I my favourite moment was like one of the first episodes that we did, the ethnic diversity in SLT, because I think it set the tone of our like later episodes really nicely where we talked about the history of speech and language therapy and how you know it was in um elocutionist sort of history and that was quite nice because i don't think many people know whether you're black white asian you don't we didn't really know the history of slt so that was quite nice and then to relate that back to why in modern day now why how that's impacted um the lack of diversity so that was quite quite interesting for me yeah that was super interesting top three episode (laughs) (laughs) um (laughs) Um, yeah I just wanted to mention the um, Black History Month series as well it was just so nice to use um, our platform to sort of highlight the voices of uh, black therapists and just hear more about their journeys as well Um, so yeah that was I thought was a highlight for me as well yeah definitely credit to Miriam for um, sharing that series that was really good Um, it was really nice that like just that interview one to one kind of like it was a lot more chill it was really nice definitely yeah and met so many amazing students so yeah. it's just um really thinking that they're going to be future speech and language therapists as well yeah definitely more interview series in the future i think for us yeah um okay i'm gonna move on to the next question uh we've kind of spoke about it already um and sort of touched upon it but um what is would you say is one new thing that you've learned through SLT time? I mean, we've learned lots, like we said, but if you had to pick one, like, advice, one lesson that you learned that you would pass on through SLT time, what would you say? I think what I've learned is the importance of building a network. And so many of us went through our courses in university thinking we're the only ones experiencing the things that we did. And now from meeting each other and um, listening to each other's stories and finding out what's working, we can see that um, having groups for BAME people in the workplace and at university is very beneficial. Um, I think one of the things I've learned, um, and it it may be slightly controversial, is just about checking your privilege. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's not just for... um, the, us as um, speech and language therapists or students, but also for black and white people overall, I think it's it's important to also check your own privilege and understand where you are coming from and how your privilege might affect somebody else as well. So I think that's quite um, a crucial thing for me to kind of always take with me that. Um, whilst I may think I'm disadvantaged, I'm actually probably more advantaged than somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, so I need to be aware of that. I think I've learned the key thing is speaking out and how important it is to speak out and realizing that something that you're feeling or noticing, you're not the only one. Like, as some said, we've, some of us have felt like. Like if we raise this with other people or somewhere else, that we might we be overreacting. I think that's a key thing that everyone has said in the big, like in the beginning episode that we think is overreacting when someone said this. Like we weren't sure if we if we raise it, people might look at us like we're making it a big deal. And then when what I've learned is that it's not. And if you ever think like that, then it's definitely not. So um, that's something that I've taken away from having everyone here listening to everyone's stories. Mm-hmm. Say I've learned um, that people are there are more people that are willing to have these difficult conversations than I thought, and I kind of thought when we started this that people would be like, oh yeah, okay, we we're not racist, it's fine, whatever, and then not really think about the nuances and the different um, kind of topics that we were delving into and how it isn't just I am racist, I am not. There's a whole other like stream of things that you need to think about. Um, I kind of I was a bit worried that people wouldn't really respond to it, but people are 
kind of ready to have that conversation or at least have their ears opened to it. Whether they're ready to act on it yet, I don't know. I mean, who knows how we'll know. I don't know if there's a measure to find out. But I do think people are a lot are ready to have that talk and ready to make themselves feel uncomfortable. Um, I really learned a lot from the youth justice um, episode. And I, I knew that there were quite a lot of offenders with speech and language difficulties, but I didn't realise that um, so many um, people who have got developmental language disorder will re-offend. Um, and I think that was quite an interesting point. And I think there's a, a real lack of awareness around developmental language disorder. And um, yeah, there definitely needs to be more training and things on that. But also, it kind of made me think about, you know, how many speech and language therapists do work in youth justice system? Um, are there speech and language therapists in all areas of the UK who work in the youth justice system? Probably not. Um, so I would quite like to know what is going to be done about that in the future, because I think it's a really important area of work. I think um, we've all also kind of learned through our um, like preparation for episodes and stuff, just kind of the lack of resources and research that's available out there. I think um, we've had to learn that through um, when we decide on a topic that we want to talk about and we put we start putting things together and deciding kind of where we're going to go with that conversation. We actually realise that there's nothing there to base that on. We're, we're starting from basically complete scratch, um, having these completely like novel conversations based purely on experiences and, you know, personal experiences um so I think it really made me and I'm sure like everybody and Mariam especially as well the lack of research that there is and and how important it is to fill that gap um and how actually it's going to have to be us or somebody like us who is going to fill that gap otherwise it's not going to get done yeah, but I also think um, Dr. Reem made a really good point that um, it's actually quite hard sometimes to get these kind of, um, to get papers published on these topics. Yeah, exactly. And I think that comes down to the sy systemic racism as well within the whole system because, you know, people are only going to publish papers which they deem are important. And clearly, there's not enough people at the top that think these kind of issues are worth researching and discussing. So, I mean, something clearly has to change there, you know, because people are sometimes doing the research and then not actually able to publish it. And that's, you know, a really big issue, isn't it? How do you guys feel that our profession, speech and language therapy, has changed over the last few months because of SLT time, but also just over the last few months through everything that's been happening? I mean, I definitely think that there has been change, like the Royal College are much more engaged and I think that they're doing a lot of work now, which wasn't there before, like the Anti-Racism Forum and um, the, the event that they're planning with that. Um, so yeah, I think there has been a shift in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. I think there's been a really strong shift to the right direction. Um, I think for me, I'm very like, I need to see the results right now. And I also know that I like love the bamboo analogy because it is true. Like, it's not going to be there straight away. I, like, you have to wait, obviously. But I think as a profession, we definitely have moved more towards um, thinking about culture in a way that isn't just theoretical and not just like, oh, they come from a poorer background, so they might not have a laptop. So you have, can't do therapy this way when like culture is like a lot more nuanced than that and um yeah like Rafara said um thinking about my own privilege as well and that like us and us as speech and language therapists um how we I think a lot has changed in, the, in terms of the way that we are kind of made to relate to people I don't know if I've made that clear I'm out to think about what I'm trying to say and then I'll come back again. I'm very <laughs> tired. I'm so I think like what you mentioned about like RCSLT being a lot more proactive and also a lot more open about what's been going on before everything was sort of it, almost like behind a paywall. Like we couldn't see anything. We didn't really know what was going on. And now it's a lot more like transparent. But also there is like HCPC also now collecting data about the diversity of its of their members, which I think is really great because we all have to be registered with HCPC. So there's no it's very few people that you're gonna miss, whereas RCSLT membership is is optional. So I think that um 
I think we are part of that catalyst that really has pushed this. And now six months down the line, we still see continued Im improvement in this, which is really good. And, and let's hope that it carries on into the new year as well. But also another thing that's really nice is the, um, like the global movement. So not just UK SLTs, but also American SLPs um, talking about how they're the 8% and opening up platforms in there um in in us as well which is really nice because it almost makes you think there are so many similarities between our experiences yes there are differences in terms of how how their service is provided but still the the experience um is, is similar and and the struggle is the same as well so it's quite nice to see that we're all kind of together definitely speaking of the hcpc that reminds me that um the other day I was just going through the standards that we all need to um, abide and it was saying that um, we have to know how to work with um, with uh, service users from different cultures and so I think that our work is really ensuring that um, more people are aware of how to do that it properly. Yeah this might sound strange but I really feel like um, the whole, you know, this whole movement and getting people to think more about diversity has actually helped me get a job because, you know, it took me a long time to get a job. <laughs> and um, I do feel like people, you know, they obviously just want to employ people that are similar to them, don't they really? But I feel like in the last couple of months with people thinking more about diversity and trying to make teams more diverse, I think it's really helped me. Yeah, I agree. I think I've definitely seen a difference. I think on social media, there's a massive difference within the SLT world in the conversation around diversity, which is great to see. I think we've always talked about how we could maybe filter that into um, reaching other speech and language therapists that are not necessarily on social media. And um, I think I've seen a difference in like, even with my work colleagues, like more discussions around race and things that we could do um within like um our provision to sort of accommodate well not accommodate that's the wrong word but to sort of support um families from like diverse backgrounds which is which is great um i think i don't know if we're saying not necessarily a negative thing but i'm going to say anyway you can take it out if you want <laughs> um, but i think what i <laughs> I think just what I'm aware of is looking forward yeah I think it would be great to have um, pe um, speech and language therapists from a diverse background as well as sort of white middle class which we know is um, the majority of speech and language therapists also talking about this topic and also um, taking the lead on projects, for example, as well, rather than it just being left um, to speech language therapists from a diverse backgrounds to do the work. Um, I think we kind of still see that still, and that will be, I think that's a good sort of maybe next step to sort of um, expand the conversation, I guess. Yeah. Anne and I were talking um, the other day about how exhausted we are. We were like, you know what? All people of colour deserve a holiday for the rest of 2020. Yeah. We were like, we're not doing our episode. We're exhausted. We're so done. We've been having so many conversations, so many fights, so many, all of this work that we've been doing. And like, we're just, that's it, over it. I was just going to say, like echoing everyone's thoughts. And it seems like there's more priority and... yeah. Um, like around these things and the issues that you know people of color and therapists face um, and I think also there's more responsibility from trusts and universities and it seems like I mean I'm only seeing it on social media mostly but it seems like things are changing um, and you know things are being put in place so I'd love to see that kind of continue and hopefully it's not just happening kind of now hopefully it's going to be a long-term thing and things are in place but it's it's exciting to see yeah yeah Saha also I wanted to say um to add on there's not only priority but I feel like there's a sense of urgency as well um so I think that before 
it's kind of like, yeah, we recognize some people don't even recognize it's a problem, but um, yeah, but most people, when now it feels like there's an urgency, people want to find out how to change their practice immediately and see what small things they can do to make it more inclusive. Um, but I mean, personally, between a couple of weeks, I had a different reaction from a senior member of staff around diversity talks. Yeah, so a senior member of staff sort of asked how would this benefit our service? Like, how does this, how that benefit us as a service? Um, which I was taken aback. But then a couple of weeks later, once it became on, came on the agenda and it was a um, hot topic, um, it was like, Seleka, would you like to talk about this? And um, I find that very interesting. I mean, it's a good, it's a good thing that it's changed. But um, honestly, I think it's probably a, a, a wide variety of things. But I know that also um, the podcast has helped with that because just sort of having our um, perspectives out there um, widely accessible has been really beneficial. I was just going to say, Suleika, I think I agree with you. And I think that's what I was trying, what I was alluding to, not necessarily that experience itself, but just the experience of maybe um, speech and language therapists from diverse backgrounds having to have that extra baggage while they're in work. So it's sort of that expectation that they will lead um, sessions or they will lead um, um, webinars or whatever it might be. Um, on diversity and that's added work on top of their usual speech and language therapy duties so I think it's just important for us to mention that just because um, there might be speech and language therapists that listen to our podcasts um, that might be asked um, you know to do topics or talk about it which is, which is great it's great that um, that's being talked about but I think it's for managers to sort of bear in mind that that's an extra added pressure for them. And it's actually something that we're affected by. So it's quite personal mm -hmm. as well. I think with a lot of topics that we covered, um, for me personally, it's things that I've experienced or my families have experienced. So it's not something easy for us to talk about. I mean, it's great that we're quite open and honest about it and it opens the platform and it makes, and I think what's great about it as well. So for example, students can see, you know, speech and language therapists talking about it openly. Um, but I think just bearing in mind what we might expect um, others to be doing on top of their usual duties as well. Yeah, yeah I completely agree. And I think also for anyone who's the only person in their team that might um, be from a minority not to feel the pressure and feel free to say no, um, because it's not on you to talk about this. It's, it, yeah, it's a trust thing. Um, a university thing that's for institutions to think about and um, not individuals and it can be really awkward um doing that in front of your own team yeah and i think um only time will tell kind of how much of the work within our trusts and within the large organizations is performative tokenism um i think um the biggest barrier for us now moving forward is actually sustaining that um keeping these topics relevant and of interest to the people who are, are in the positions to do anything about it and um making sure that you know like you were both saying that the change is not just coming from us and people like us but from management and from our white colleagues and etc cetera, etc cetera. everybody else everyone needs to be in the discussion now and i think that is pretty much our future vision really isn't it I just think we should um, mention the fact that um, SLT time has been uh, recommended by a lot of universities on their reading list, but I don't remember the details, but I think it's quite important. Yeah, definitely. I was just going to uh, move on to what else has have we done outside of just the podcast, and so that's a really good point is um, universities, a lot of universities have put us on their reading list as CPD and further reading for their students. And like Veronica mentioned in the beginning, um, a couple of us have done some like guest lectures and seminars at, at universities um, and having like Q&As with students, which I think have been really interesting and really beneficial. A lot of us were members of the um, Magpie seminar with by Amy Stevens as well, like, like we mentioned. Um, and yeah, so I think 
what else have we achieved um, outside of the podcast? So all of this, and we've started sort of collating research and resources together, haven't we? And we've got like a bank of things now, um, which continues to grow. And hopefully we can come up with a structured way to share that and make that accessible with people um, within our profession. Um, we've also had presence at, uh, you know, hubs. Teba was, um, spoke at the East Midlands Hub. Do you want to talk yeah. about that for like a little bit? Yeah. Um, it was really, um, it was really cool. It, I recognised a few names from like students who I'd met at the uh, uh, student day, but also like professionals that you always see on Twitter, but you never like yeah. you're too intimidated to like talk to. But um, yeah, it was really nice to just be able to like reflect back on where we started from and what our aim is, and um, to outline our like future journey, which um, it was really helpful for like. Ilya to to help us direct that um but it, it's nice to see our next steps which means you know looking at funding and merchandise and all those things that are going to be able to make us grow um so yeah it was really good and, and uh, yeah I, I hope we can speak at more of the hub meetings in the next year definitely and Mariam spoke with her whole trust basically yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes that was really good that was like opening the first conversation around race like trust wide um which was really nice i think we had some really um fruitful conversations and there's some talks around things that we can change um for example like um how we take case histories um or some of the therapies that we might expect parents to complete and whether they're in line with like culture and diversity um I think as well, I just wanted to mention, I've been doing some work with um, Birmingham City Uni, which is my old uni where I graduated from. And I think they had a really good approach. Um, so um, I was invited as a guest lecturer. So this was for a normal um, lecture around case studies. Um, but I think it was around making sure that some of their lecturers are you know, from diverse backgrounds as well. Um, and thinking about case studies in general, but also embedding cultural competency within that. Um, and then from that, I've been helping some of my lecturers with um, assessments as well, which has been really good. And this has all been, um, you know, paid guest lecturing. And I think that's like, I was, first of all, I was like, how am I working with my lecturer, who is my tutor, who I absolutely love, <laughs> but it's just crazy. Um, but I think, that's I think that's the way going forward of universities um, sort of using some of the resources out there um, I think and also like them paying me was just a given I didn't have to ask for it I yeah. didn't have to be like uh, awkward situation here yeah. <laughs> and I think that's really important to note as well but I think that the way they did it was great yeah, 100%. I was saying the same I, with Reading as well. It had the same sort of acknowledgement that, I mean, this deserves to be paid for. You're like, you're providing yeah. CPD for my students. And I think it's really important, like we were saying, that, you know, we are, this is our, our extra time that we put into all of this. And it's quite nice to be acknowledged for it properly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and we see like quite a lot of opportunities come out and a lot of them are like volunteer positions and yeah like and it's just like really yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think it's just worth mentioning as hint hint if you're asking anyone to do extra work for you then please yeah, pay yeah. them <laughs> yeah, you can pay <laughs> because their time is valuable email addresses in the comments send me money yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> exactly um what else have we done um I think we've all got really strong presence everywhere um with Royal College things that are happening, the anti-racism forums, I think quite a lot of us are members of that. Um, the um, the diversity, ethnic diversity planning group thing that came from the Royal College, I forgot the official name of it, but that was a nice event that happened a few months ago that um, pretty much all of us were present of, uh, present at. And also, um, I think also our projects that we've done with other platforms have been really nice, like uh, the BMOT uh, platform, SLTs of Colour, of course, our besties, um, Listen In Podcast, and um, yeah, all of those kind of platforms that emerged over the lockdown and 
through 2020. I think it's been really nice doing some cross collab stuff with them. So I did, I spoke with um, AHP on the front line, AHP is on the front line, at AHP on the front line, um, with them. Yeah, and they were lovely and we did like an interview with them. I did an interview with them, which was really nice. And also with OT and Chill, it's another platform, which is really cool, um, which is hosted by a OT called Kwame. And um, he did a really nice project where he like made all these MDT people like have a line to say in his podcast and stuff. So stuff like that has been really cool and really nice as well. Yeah, and so how you were in the RCSL2 bulletin and I think you did a careers event. So yeah, doing lots of interesting things. Yeah, the outreach stuff has been really fun this year. I feel like I've had more time to actually do it as well, which yeah. is really, really nice. And I think it helps for students, like I've a couple of students have just been reaching out and asking for like advice and yeah it's just been really nice I think again like I can't remember who said it but like the community and yeah. um, building the network yeah definitely yeah I think that's like reaching out and connecting with other people has been amazing so any students out there I would definitely don't be shy reach out connect with people it makes such a difference um yeah and really important mm -hmm. I thought it would be nice to talk about our, we've kind of, again, been mentioning this here and there, but what our next steps are and what we hope to achieve in the future. So first, um, I just made some points about sort of overall stuff that we've spoken about. And then if anybody wants to chip in with their personal or their views on what the future looks like for SLT time, then feel free to do so. So... I think um, during the peak of events in 2020 and when we first formed, creating a safe space for speech therapists from ethnic minority and diverse backgrounds was so vital and so needed um, during that time. And I think now with the platform that exists and the platform that we've all created, I think there's been a shift in our focus. Um, I think for we realized that for real change to happen, um, we can't just be having conversations amongst ourselves, but we need to be bringing in people who um, have the ability to actually make substantial change. So these are um, our white colleagues and our white peers, university leaders, uh, people who are in positions of power or people higher up on the food chain. These are all people who I think that we've slowly begun to integrate into our episodes, um, which I think is going to continue to be a focus now of SLT time. Um, and I also think that for us, um, it would it's vital for us to increase our outreach. People who might not be so engaged on social media, but how can we utilize this network that we we are creating and we are we are building um, to reach those people who might not be so aware of the discussions that are happening and therefore not really implementing any change. Those are the people that really need to be hearing the stuff um, that we talk about. Um, and I think. Um, like we were talking about continuing with you know high quality research resource making packages and and compiling things that are out there so that they're easily accessible for our whole profession um, and yeah continuing our involvement with other projects so just now we mentioned a bunch of things that we've all been involved with collectively but also individually and I think that's really important for us to continue to uh, increase our presence increase our outreach increase our network um, and just continue sort of um, you know pushing this the agenda forward and last two points is I think again along with network about supporting sort of emotional mental health of all of our fellow speech therapists who are from black and I think minority backgrounds um, you know, who, they're all fighting their own battles for increased representation, diversity, cultural competency um, within their professions. And I think it's vital for us to continue supporting that because it is a difficult fight. We've all been, we're all having it. We're all going to continue having it. And I think um, our network is a great safe space to support, you know, those emotions amongst us. Um, and also continuing and hopefully increasingly working alongside the Royal College uh, I know we, we, we started SLT uh, angsty, like angsty teenagers, like Royal College was the annoying parent that we were trying to brush off our shoulder. But I think now we've sort of like uh, matured out of adolescence and uh, come to realize that we need them. And we, the whole 
change is going to happen when we work together. Um, so how can we utilize Royal College and I'll work with them to focus on community outreach, um, data collection, which we're not able to do so much ourselves. Uh, again, accessing those, you know, hard to access, you know, professionals across the country um, and just continuing the discussions for us. So I think those were things that I thought I would love um, SRT time to go in the direction of and as a vision. Um, does anybody have anything else they want to add in terms of where they see us for 2021 year? I think it'd be nice if we um, did more work um, with colleges and maybe people thinking about getting into the profession and um, because I think a lot of what we've done at the moment is aimed at current speech and language therapists which I think is great and is obviously needed but it'd be nice as well I think I'm very interested I'm working with um, secondary school children at the moment and they even though I see them for therapy they don't really understand what a speech and language therapist is which I find fascinating I was going to start going into it in Houston I was going to say well I believe children are the future and if you teach them well <laughs> they will let them lead the way and I think children will lead the way in speech Definitely. therapy. Definitely. And that's why we need to start planting those seeds, like the bamboo. And in five years, it'll be growing underground. After that, there'll be speech and language therapists. And they'll take over SLT time whilst we get all the ad revenue as founders. <laughs> that that's is it. the end goal. I would, <laughs> I would love to hand over this whole, whole thing to the next generation. Yeah. yeah. I see what you did there with bamboo, by the way. Love Thank that. You. Uh, but you, you mentioned as well about, um, funny, I didn't mention that as well, but we would love to um, go down a uh, merchandise and funding route as well, I think, in the future is one of our goals because, um, one, merch is cool. Two, um, it kind of gives us some value to the work that we're doing and we are able to make better content if we're actually getting like support financially for it we can subtitle our videos i know everybody everyone you're watching keep telling us to do it we know we want to do it so badly but we have to individually subtitle each video so it's not easy it's not it's not available for us it's not within our whatever we can't do that right now but we really want to do it um and if we were being funded then we can um pay for somebody else to do it which would make our lives a lot easier and other stuff like that as well, like spending time on research and um, guest lecturers maybe and stuff, guest speakers and stuff. So, yeah, funding in March 2021. Yeah, definitely agree with all of those. I think I have some, like, achievable visions and I have some things like if we could do yeah. anything in the world, where would we be? And those are a little bit extreme. We could do anything in the world, Hello. But, <laughs> you, know, you have to make smart goals, remember. Just reach for it. I think, yeah, I think all the points that you mentioned, I think it would be great to, like, work with trust a lot more and do maybe some, like, guest appearances. I think there's a lot that we can offer. I think thinking about um resources having like a resource base um where we might have like easy to reach um fact sheets or resources that we can use for example like the colorful semantics pack that i had the other day that i was using i just looked at the pictures and i was like oh my god like none of these are representative of the children that i'm i'm with this is like really bad so then i had to change it so sort of things things like that that um will make you know that people can just access or yeah. um little like summaries of maybe like the episodes as well i think that's something like yeah. that would be really yeah. useful um yeah working with like families like the one in the conversation that we had um with dr dr hamis Dakwa, she has like um a really good setup with um encouraging families to continue with their culture and their language and doing something like that would be amazing um and yeah research always like doing more research and um, yeah just just so many ideas Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for our end of 2020 episode for catching up with the SLT time team. Um, thank you also so much just for your continued support, engagement and interactions with us over the year to all of our guests and to all of our listeners and to everybody on Twitter and beyond. Um, thanks for everything. And we hope that you continue to do so in the new year. Um, uh, so happy holidays. and. Happy New Year as well. And we will see you all in 2021 with a brand new season, brand new topics and brand new guests and hopefully new vision, 
new look, everything. Who knows? The world's always so right now, to be honest. Um, but yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Be sure to follow our Twitter and our Instagram. SLT Timed. At SLT Timed. SLT Timed to keep up to date with new re episode releases. And that's the SLT for today.